Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the special business meeting for the District of Squamish for Tuesday, October 26th. Hatsqualoan, please look to Latsko, Holtmish, Okameo. We're very privileged uh, to be working today on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Uh, motion to adopt the special agenda by Councilor Hertford, second by Councilor Race. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, so, first up, uh, we have our library 2022 presentation to council. So we're joined today by Hillary Bloom, our director of library services and Molly Loden, chair of the Squamish library board. Pass it over to you. Good morning, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to present our request to you today. My name is Hilary Bloom, Director of Library Services, and here with me is our Library Board Chair, Molly Loudon. Ms. Loudon will be speaking at the end of our presentation. It's been a few months since we were last in front of Council, so I will share with you a few 2021 highlights. In the area of public programming, we've seen success with our visiting library service, pairing library volunteers with homebound patrons to deliver library materials and provide a friendly voice on the phone, checking in on a regular basis with one another. Our mix of virtual and in-person programming is striking a good balance. It, we're finding it to be more accessible for people to tune in from wherever they are for a lot of our virtual programming and plan to continue uh, incorporating it as we move forward. We're proud of the Squamish Nation education opportunities and truth and reconciliation programming we've undertaken, such as weaving, drum making, and plant walks with Soasia, as well as some events around September 30th, the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, that provided opportunities for the community to listen and learn from Squamish Nation elders as well as receive re free resources uh, on the topic of residential schools at the September 30th event, thanks to a provincial grant. In addition to our many one-off programs, many uh, ongoing programs that we've introduced in the past year have proven to have staying power. Um, new events and regular programs, such as our regular art hour that happens once a month uh, online with groups of people getting together to get getting together to do art um, through some instructional videos and conversation. Our new online book clubs have proven um, to be a great alternative for people who don't wish to venture out on a rainy night, but want to speak to one another and connect through Zoom. We've put our story times back in person as of last week, <clears throat> and we ran a very successful summer reading club with scavenger hunts and lots of creative virtual engagement this past summer. In the areas of public services and partnerships, we've got a lot going on. With the uh, capital funding provided to the library in 2021, we're going to be making some significant changes to the interior of the library at the end of this year, both to the service desk area and to the staff work area. In advance of the actual renovations, we've launched a new service desk layout, providing more central direct service as patrons arrive, and we're finding it to be very well received. Patrons are asking questions and seeking help more than ever. We're inst installing a permanent takeout window at the back of the library, making it more and more convenient for people to pick up their holds and return their materials. We're also changing the layout for our staff to allow for more workspace in the work staff work area. I've become involved with the Community Resilience Committee, which is a newly formed committee alongside Helping Hands, RCMP, Vancouver Coastal Health, Mental Health, 
community neighbors and the district, and we're working to address neighborhood concern concerns and arrive at community led solutions. Also wanted to highlight um, how proud we are of the uh, window installation this year that's sharing and making visible Squamish nation, nation culture and history and highlighting the amazing talent of a young local Squamish nation artist, Siobhan Joseph. Our library board has been very busy. We've made all sorts of new gains in the area of governance and organization. Uh, we launched a new software program to help manage uh, board files and agendas, um, which has been really wonderful, especially as we um, continue to uh, meet in a virtual format. Um, we also received a multicultural grant to do uh, some Indigenous relations training that uh, board and staff undertook about 10 days ago, which uh, was a really great learning opportunity for um, board and staff together. Also, the um, library board has created a new committee structure with two separate committees that allows for trustees to focus in more specifically in certain areas and keep everyone engaged. And our staff, I will say that the restoration of services um, emerging from COVID has been a learning and growing experience. Um, we had an, an organizational review undertaken and I'm gonna speak to that a little bit more in detail at a later slide. But one of the other great advances for us was new scheduling software. Um, which has really improved a lot of aspects for us. It's helping uh, us to make decision making or to, to, to make decisions around staffing at certain hours, uh, especially as we've introduced the new staffing uh, and service desk model. So just a really much more visual way of figuring out where we need people when and also identifying gaps and um, lean areas. Um, finally, I introduced a compressed work week for my full time staff. So they now work a 4 day work week um, and 3 days off um, and they work. 1 Saturday a month, and it's allowing us to staff the library, but provide a really great work life balance. We're finding that everything uh, takes more energy than it used to in terms of providing service to the public. And it's really important for staff to have um, a healthy balance in their life. And one other um, 2021 update, I just wanted to um, highlight that these, the regional district, the SLRD um, has brought forward additional uh, funding for the library, uh, both this year and next year um, to the tune of $35,000 annually, which is um, very helpful to offset some of the revenue streams that are still not back to 100% for the library. And secondly, I wanted to point out that we've launched um, a Canada Helps um, fundraising initiative because we are a registered charity and can issue tax receipts. We've run that for our foyer gallery. Um, actually, this month it's still happening. And that's proving to be a very successful method of raising funds. Um, and great thanks to our marketing and communications staff member. But it's a great way for the community to know about the gallery and to support it and have the opportunity to win some amazing art uh, created by the artists who have showcased in the live in the foyer gallery the last year. So moving on to the organizational review, as I mentioned, um, I was tasked by the library board with undertaking a review last year, and it was completed by the beginning of 2021. And the recommendations provide a new structure to grow into for our staff, providing increased capacity for the director via a management team, but also increased capacity in other areas and a more defined and functional reporting structure. At the same time, a salary review was done to ensure that staff compensation is aligned with comparables. Um, the last review had been done over 10 years ago, so it was important to update and create a new salary grid. Um, it was interesting that the review happened to be done during COVID, I, I think, which highlighted a few important learnings we may not have um, had had it been done at a different time. Um, we learned that we had been working within a what I would call a bit of a scarcity model um, that we need more redundancy because we're too lean. And as we restore services and operate within a more patron focused service delivery model, as I mentioned, so this includes both in person, um, enhanced virtual support, in library service, takeout service, outreach services, um, we need to stop showing how much we can do with so little. We're really good at that. Um, so the recommendations were presented to the board in July and were. Uh, 
presented in a phased in approach. So we want to phase in these recommendations um, over the next four years. And so when I present to you our 2022 budget requests in a moment, those are the first stage of these changes. And they're, that will be followed by incremental increases in 2023, 24, and 25. So specifically looking at 2022, I've provided a breakdown on the slide of what the cost of just over $86,000 is for. And just to note in the agenda package, there was a memo that also included um, these numbers um, for the, this year and the future years. So there's an increase of just over $86,000 requested to implement the first stage of the plan. So this would put all of our current staff within the new salary grid model. It allows us to expand a current vacant librarian position into a management position. It establishes a coordinator structure using um, current staff and it adds some additional library assistant hours for day-to-day -day service provision, sick coverage, and vacation coverage. And I will note that all of these requests um, are included in the larger 2022 budget package that council is deliberating as presented by the district finance staff. Moving beyond 2022, we have a phased in approach to grow into the new organizational structure. And I've I outlined those costs in this slide, as well as in the memo. So in five years, we will move from just over 13 FTE to just over 16 FTE, providing the capacity for the library to deliver on what we already do, as well as offering more. We've also got a line item in 2023 for a capital request for a mobile or modular unit. And our intention is to use the coming year to further define the scope of that cap capital request. Um, as I said earlier, COVID has taught us that we need to provide redundancy. We shouldn't try to show how much we can do with too little. Excellent service models require extra energy. The best customer service comes from when staff are provided a work-life balance. Our community needs us and the director needs to lead at a strategic level and have a skilled team to handle much of the day-to-day -day operations. So I'm now gonna pass it over to our board chair, Molly Loudon to complete the presentation. Thank you, Hilary. That's great. Um, in front of you, you will see a provision request, and this is um, included in your agenda package and something that um, Hilary has been working with the team, the finance team here at City. Um, and it's a request to establish a provision so that any surpluses within the district's library budget lines will be retained by the library and used at the discretion of the library board. This aligns with board to council relationships as laid out with the Provincial Legislation Act and the Library Act. You might recall last year, as part of our restoration of services during COVID, we made a request to Council to allocate some of the anticipated surplus funding in one area to where it was needed most. By establishing a provision, it would enable the Board to direct these decisions about library funds without the step of a request to Council, which is an arrangement that reflects the Board to Council relationship as it is intended. We would ask the council to consider this request now in 2021 to help with our decision making and budgeting in 2022 and onward. And finally, looking ahead and working together, there's been a lot of work done at the trustee level about uh, the future of the library and how that integrates into a community hub downtown. Um, we want to reconfirm the board's commitment to looking ahead for the library and working together with the district as our community grows. In the past year, Hillary has continued to foster incredible relationships in many sectors, including the arts, culture and heritage groups. And we're excited to see future opportunities to create spaces for these aspects of our community makeup to become accessible to all. Um, so we look forward to continuing that partnership and working together as a board of trustees with the city as we move forward. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Council, questions for Ms. Bloom or Ms. Loudon? Go ahead, Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. 
I'm curious uh, to maybe learn a little bit more about the um, uh, mobile program. Are you aware of any uh, grants or funding opportunities specifically aimed at helping libraries to create programs um, like the, the Books on Wheels initiative? I, I think I neglected to add that as I was um, presenting the that the um, the fund that we've put there uh, for 23, the intention being that we'd be exploring more than just funding direct from the district. So I wanted to just clarify that as well. Um, I am not familiar specifically with grant funding to to deploy something specifically like a mobile library, um, but. I have had initial conversations even with other um, library directors in the region, exploring the idea of maybe something that could be a little bit more regional as opposed to um, specifically serving uh, just one area. When we talk about mobile and outreach, we serve, our library serves more than just the district, we serve area D around us. But similarly, when I think about the Sea to Sky libraries and the wide geography that we cover, there could be some great opportunities at more of a regional approach to, um, to achieve that. And in the same way, our libraries in the Sea to Sky do a lot of um, coordination and collaboration on, on events and initiatives, I could see that this could be a really interesting way to engage potentially with the regional district, for example, on something a little bit larger scale, especially as Area D is slated to really grow and expand um, in the coming in the coming years. Uh, I also wanted to ask about other communities um, that may or may not be offering this type of service. Are we inventing something brand new here, or are there other towns or regions about our size that have already done this? There are definitely other towns and regions that have done and have done for many, many years. It's it's something that's for many people, it's actually a nostalgic memory if they grew up somewhere more rural. I know places like the Thompson Nicola Regional Library System that covers a massive geographic area um, relies quite heavily on the mobile unit to reach all of those places that aren't quite near um, facilities. So, um, as we explore it, there are definitely many models to look to as, as inspiration and um, structure. Thanks, Chair. That's all I had. Others? Um, can you speak a little bit more to the staffing model you're proposing and what, um, what you envision it being able to deliver in terms of program service access? Absolutely. Um, so the, I would say as well, the organizational review was a really interesting way to take a look at where we're at and then look outward and the consultant we had um, has worked in lots of different library systems around Canada and had a great perspective on different ways that um, things can be done because sometimes when you've been operating in one area, it's, it's hard to, to always know what else is possible. So, um, as I mentioned, this would be rolled out over the next 4 to 5 years. Um, change is a big deal and we don't want to um, just wave a wand and throw everything into a tailspin. So in the first phase, um, it would allow for there to be uh, the addition of a manager, which we don't currently have. At this point, I have a very, uh, we have a bit of a flat reporting structure. So having the manager who would be um, taking on a lot of the day-to-day -day operations as well as overseeing technology um, would provide some capacity for um, the director to be doing uh, more of the strategic things. Um, but rather than then having, um, you know, just a really tall, narrow um, hierarchy, the um, manager would be wor working with um, a group of coordinators in different areas. So we would have um, an area of public services, an area of programming and outreach, and then an area of uh, collections and technology. So that's sort of the first um, stage of it. And then what we've got room for in the future years is potentially to um, add an additional uh, member of the management team to, again, just as we anticipate growth and in, in both technology, as well as really wanting to be out there and meeting people where they're at, 
with programming and outreach, we see that we need to get to that point. Um, for me, having been in this role as long as I have, it's it's a bit of a mind bender to even imagine having that much capacity. Um, so that's also why I recommended to the board that it be more of an iterative approach that we do the first phase, we see how we're doing and we check in again and see if we're ready to move you know, to the next uh, stage as proposed in this five-year plan. Um, there's so many factors that influence what we're doing and how we're operating and to the point of um, the takeout service and virtual support, um, those are new services we didn't even have before COVID. So we are, um, we've, We've determined that they're worth keeping and they're important to have now as core. Um, so some of this growth is actually just to kind of keep us at the same capacity level um, and then roll out some more expansion. Does that do you, is there specific details you wondered about? I just wondered if there was any um, particular services that you were hoping to gain from this or the ability to expand your hours further. Absolutely to expand our hours. That is, that is 1 part of it. And, um. So, even within the, the 1st, 2022 request, that's going to get us to, um. You know, expand expansion of hours, um, expansion of programming again, because all of those things have been rather. Um, low scale in the past while, um, and then the other piece of it is, um, having additional staff. To ensure that we're keeping our. Um, our, our team of staff trained and supported, because that's one of the things is, uh, I feel like we've been looking outwards a lot and offering more and more to the community. And it's really important that our staff feel like they're being kept afloat as well as we're trying to forge ahead. So, um, having, for example, an additional manager is going to be, uh, in part focusing on making sure staff capacity and training and skill sets are, um, kept afloat as well. Um. Because as the demands and expectations of our community change, we need to make sure that the staff aren't being left behind or being expected to do things that um, are beyond where they are at when they began. Will there be any parameters put on how you can spend the provision if we do transfer that ability? I think that's that's up for discussion. We wanted to present the the idea um, to council and um, for their um, contemplation, um, it, it could be, um, at this point, as we put it, it was future needs. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, it could be further defined to, to, to an extent, um, as a conversation with the board and council around what that would look like. So it, it doesn't, we haven't specified exactly how it should or shouldn't be, um, structured. And then your evaluation of the modular, mobile, regional, whatever it might be in 2023, how do you see that coming together over 2022? It's a large amount for us to put as a placekeeper in our budget in 2023 without exactly knowing what it is or how we're going to fund it or, or whether Whistler, the SLRD or others might also contribute. Like, it's just, it's a large chunk of money. That is a bit nebulous to me right now. So just trying to understand how and when you get to a decision on that. I would say that um, so the, the plan for 2022 is um, research discussions, conversations, um, and in, in my experience, and certainly I know how fast years go by and how quickly it is time to start <laughs> putting in the numbers for the next year. Um, I would say, you know, it needs to be the focus for us in the 1st, 4 months of 2022 and at that point, determine whether we're even poised to put it in for 20 can keep it in for 2023 or whether it needs to be moved a little bit further ahead. There's a lot happening with this um, organizational review and a lot of other things. So, um. Um, not that 1 should ever put something in just as a placeholder, but it's um, our intention to have that focus to start to, to make some decisions around it. Um, whether it remains as a 23 ask is um, to be determined. I would say from our point of view, because it, it's possible that it. 
we may not be quite at the point to be able to articulate it clearly to counsel for you to make a decision around it as a 23 request. Thank you. Council, any other questions? Um, got Council Pettengill and then Council Race. Thank you, and, and thanks for the presentation. I'm just wondering if, um, I guess I'm struggling to understand the provision piece a little bit. Uh, normally, um, we'll get specific asks for increases or, or certain projects. Um, when I look at the Library Act that, that's been quoted here, it seems to suggest that whatever money we hand over, even if it's, you know, we discuss it in the context of a budget, ultimately it's the library's decision on how that money gets spent. Um, so I guess I'm trying to understand what, what a provision adds or changes. And I guess a companion question to that is, what's the sort of a, accountability and, and what are we talking about here? So if a project that we discussed gets canceled, is that a, a surplus that can then reallocate it for a different purpose? And is there some sort of a, accountability sort of similar outcome that's expected? And just trying to sort of understand, you know, how all that works. At the moment, the way that um, the library lines within the district budget are set up, um, if we happen to not fully spend our staffing budget one year or any other line, um, those um, m monies are uh, within the district's general funds. So they're not um, something that the library board then makes a decision about what to do with for future. So that's essentially the, the simple way of explaining the difference. Um, in to Molly's point, um, with coming forward with this, um, I have chatted with um, the district finance staff about this and, and presented it um, as a request um, for council to deliberate. Um, I'm not sure whether Roland or Heather are on the call and wish to chime in at all. Um, I'm forgetting what your next part of that was. You were, can you just ask again? Well, I guess, um, you know, we get an ask with, you know, we want to do these projects and here's why we want this money and, and there's some outcomes associated uh, with those projects. Um, and and so if for whatever reason a project doesn't happen or a staff member doesn't happen, we don't get that outcome. Is there any sort of expectation or assurance that, you know, if that money is reallocated, the sort of ultimate outcome is still the same or similar? Or I guess sort of what's what's that accountability in terms of um, you know, the, that we were generally staying aligned to the original purposes or intents, even if the sort of projects or individual staff members for the funding change. My best way to describe it, I think, is because most of what the district funds the library isn't um, project specific. So uh, we receive funding for staffing, guard service, a grant to purchase materials, um, some training funding, things like that. Um, so operationally, um, a lot of what we, so it's not tied to individual projects. So I guess I'm just sort of thinking ahead and this is a new concept for me as well. Um, if there were any surpluses, then I imagine we would be um, communicating, reporting back to council about what our intention is to do with those um, changes. But um, the intention isn't to take funds earmarked for a very specific defined purpose and then pop them somewhere else. It's more around the mechanism of if things need to be shifted slightly, then it doesn't require the board to come to council to ask for those adjustments to be made. Um, I may not be doing the best job of explaining that, but um, that's that's how I would describe it. Um, I think that that differs perhaps from other 
like departments and how their budgets show up in the district um, line. So um, when it comes to the library, there's only so many things that we get funded for and it's not as sort of delineated. And they have an independent board. Hence the, I think the ask around the flexibility to allocate provision as they see fit. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I, I vaguely recall and maybe my memory isn't quite correct, but that there's been an ask associated with, uh, you know, new computers are needed. And so that's been part of the rationale for some of the money we've given. And then I'm just imagining for whatever reason, unavailability and so on, the board just decides to go in a totally different direction. Actually, IT isn't where we want our investment this year. And, and so that's what I guess I'm trying to understand is, is we're saying we're okay with that sort of um, saying, actually, we want to do uh, fund community performances with that money instead, just all things considered, that's where we are. And so is that the sort of thing that we expect is okay, or is there some sort of restrictions around that? That's what I'm not understanding, I guess. I think maybe this also, when I think about it to do with timing, so we will still be setting up a budget for the year ahead with intentions for use. And so when we talk about a provision and surplus, it's looking at by, you know, as we're looking at how that spend went that year, where are we at now? And if there's any surplus, where are we going with that in the future? And then communicating that back and forth to council. So um, in the same way, I, I'm accountable to my board and how our budget is spent. Um, I'm, I, I, the library is not at liberty to just mid year pivot and use funds for something completely different. So I feel like the mechanisms are in place and the reporting is in place that um, that type of scenario I don't see as being an, a, a problematic issue to contemplate. Councilor Reese. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this was an interesting thing for me because um, over the years, of course, as a member of council, uh, I've participated in budget decisions which allocate monies to the library uh, each year according to their budget ask. Um, and I had somehow just assumed that the library would get those monies. Uh, and so when I got on the board this year and discussions started around this, it was a bit of a surprise to me to realize that uh, these monies are actually kind of doled out uh, bit by bit by the district. Uh, and if they're not used for any reason, such as a vacancy in staff or something of that nature, um, they go into the accumulated surplus of the district, uh, not a similar thing with the library. Uh, and I think, um, so this, this move would be to allow the library uh, to, in effect, retain such funds uh, that might arise as a form of accumulated surplus and then deal with them in subsequent years or even perhaps in the same year uh, in ways they see fit according to, I think, certain criteria. Uh, and so it is, there is a bit more autonomy with the library board, uh, I'll suggest, than there would be with a department head uh, at the district who doesn't sort of have that flexibility. Uh, and I think it's appropriate, but I also think just the same as we are now uh, and have been putting criteria around what we might use accumulated surplus for, uh, I think it's a fair thing to discuss uh, what sort of a reserve, uh, which is to me sort of a synonymous term, uh, what sort of a reserve uh, these monies might fall into at the library board and what the purpose of that reserve is, uh, at least in broad terms. And so I think that is a discussion we can have uh, and with the library board. Um, and uh, and hopefully this will work. And I'm, it's partly a question, but I'm assuming that this discussion will happen in our budget discussions. It's not something we're going to decide today, uh, but it gives us, I think, a moment to pause and, and think about that um, and before we actually do get into it in a budget decision. I'm assuming that's correct, Mara. <laughs> The library ask gets contemplated during our budget. And provisions of, first of all, whether or not we want to go this provision route, and secondly, what criteria we might put around it. We can um, 
choose to do that today or at the next budget meeting where we wrap things up. Okay, call to the chair then. Um, the second point was just around um, the community hub aspect, and this has taken a significant amount of the planning committee's time at the library board, and I've been a member of the planning committee. Uh, and it is, I think, a really crucial time for the library, um, not right now, but in the coming years, uh, as they start to provide for a longer future and, and, a, and an expanded community expanded services and so forth and i think uh, how that community hub comes together who else might be part of it what other organizations uh, where it might locate and so forth will be some critical decisions facing both the library board uh, and the district council i think over the next probably the next year uh, significant progress will be made in that i hope uh, so i just wanted to highlight that sort of on everybody's radar uh, that will be I think a critical thing for our community uh, for the long term. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. So um, we will move now into the 2022 to 2026 financial plan um, and we're dealing with the general fund capital projects today um we'll take a recess part way through this discussion i expect it will be long oh okay we'll take five now to refresh our coffees All right, we're back in our special business meeting. We're on to our general fund capital projects, and I'm handing it over to our finance staff, Mr. Russell. Good morning, Mayor, members of council, general public. Uh, my name is Roland Russell, and I'm joined here today by our CFO, Heather Boxroot. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the presentation that we have available for you today. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm just gonna figure out which button to push next and we'll be on our way. Today, we're going to discuss uh, capital projects for the 2022 through 2026 financial plan period. So when we speak of these items, obviously I'm pushing the wrong button. Uh, there's a number of goals for today. The first one is to discuss uh, the presentation of capital projects, we've broken it up into a number of different groupings that uh, relate to different views that council may have of the overall picture for all our capital projects. We also want to discuss the financing aspects of capital, which will relate to a discussion of the, our reserve continuity schedule, which outlines part of our, our uh, financing plans for this year. and. If at the end of all of these discussions, uh, council is accepting of what has been pre presented, there is a resolution at the end of the package requesting <coughs> that council determine, uh, sorry, the council ask the district to uh, include these projects in our next, uh, in our 22 through 26 financial plan. The financial plan is built on key drivers. The key drivers that we have in our financial plan for this year are strategic plan drivers, master plan drivers, and the other grouping, which could be termed organizational plan, but organizational plan realistically reflect items that are required for purposes of safety, legislate, legislative requirements, or risk. Should also point out that under the strategic plan, there's a number of different criteria that have been outlined by, by council to meet their strategic goals. And we are attempting to align 
both our capital projects and our organizational plans to meet those targets. So on with the capital projects, we have a couple of different uh, presentations and groupings. So the first one we're gonna talk about is capital plans by category. And capital plans by category are going to be broken up in this manner. You'll note that the majority of our capital plans uh, are designed to meet master plan targets. So it's about 60% in total, uh, 25 of the overall 40 million. We have some projects that are designed to meet growth requirements of the organization and also those that are required to meet organizational plan requirements. We've outlined this uh, grouping and we're pointing out that this is the same grouping that council sees quarterly on their quarterly financial report. Another methodology to group our capital projects is capital projects by department. Capital projects by department may look a little more familiar in some ways in that this is a manner that is similar to what council would see within their financial plan. So in the actual financial plan bylaw, you will see a section where it shows the capital plans and the capital plans there are summarized by department. So you'll see general government, protective services, transportation, environment, and parks. And uh, those are the major areas in which we have capital projects ongoing. And we will speak to what projects are new and what projects are, are being designed to meet specific requirements of the organization as we move forward through the presentation. Number of our projects are tax funded. You can see we have a list here. Uh, there are approximately $2 million in total tax funded projects in 2020 fiscal year. And it should be noted that of these, there's $1.5 million worth of tax funding in 2022. And that is because some of these projects are supported in by areas other than taxation. And those specific projects are paving, the line painting, and the storm sewer system. And that is as a result of a couple of years ago, 2020, due to COVID, council recommended a reduction in the overall tax support for capital projects and cap and council also recommended that the district not reduce the overall spending on capital projects and that they fund the difference through the use of accumulated surplus so we have done that and over time what you will see is that we are scaling back on the use of accumulated surplus and we're pushing those dollars back into tax so that they are tax supported over time. So you will see that the tax support requirement for capital projects increases over time over the next, over this financial plan between 22 and 26. We have a number of additional projects that are funded uh, in the capital plan. And we have projects that are designed specifically to allow us to manage the climate emergency. So we have projects related to climate mitigation and also climate, <clears throat> excuse me, and also projects related to climate adaptation. Should be noted that with the flood protection upgrades, we have a specific project, Wanek Park Sea Dike, which uh, is included in 2022. It has commenced this year and will extend into 2022. We have a placeholder for flood protection upgrades for future years from 22 and 23 through 26. There are not specific projects identified by our engineering group that will use up that $4 million per year. What we are anticipating is that through the process of studies and uh, what's the term I'm looking for, additional work that is being undertaken in 2021, 
our engineering group is reviewing the design and the priorities for the next round of flood protection upgrades. So what we're anticipating is that in the 2023 budget, you will see specific projects identified to use this funding. So at this point in time, we're including it because we we have a commitment to uh, the climate emergency. We have a commitment to ongoing dike maintenance and upgrades. And these are significant and large projects. And so we, you know, when we bring a project together, it would require the funding from two or three years quite often. So for an, as an example, the Wanek Park Sea Dike is a $10 million project in total. So as you can see, based on the funding for flood protection upgrades, that would be a two or three year ask. So we don't do major projects every year. We do them every few years and we include a budget amount in there every year to reflect the fact that this is an ongoing commitment of the community. Another section that we would like to point out this year makes this particular highlight this year is real estate and facilities master plan as part of council's requests and their strategic plan they had requested that three shovel ready projects be brought forward by administration um, in this uh, cycle so that they would be available to commence by 2022 and we have undertaken the valley cliff fire hall Project has commenced already and is uh, coming out of the ground rather nicely. The next two projects on that listing are Fire Hall Number no. Two, Garibaldi Estates, and Public Works facility at the Public Works Yard. And those projects are in the process of design. And uh, our director of infrastructure and construction will provide a little additional information on that uh, later in this package. Okay, so that outlines the projects that have been undertaken to meet the goals of the real estate and facilities master plan. You'll note that there are uh, a number of projects this year and, and extending out into 2023. And then the other project that we would like to note that is uh, a highlight, it's a new project this year, is the Brennan Park Recreation Center revitalization project. And that is a grant supported project uh, and we hope to find out later this year or early in the new year whether we were successful in our grant application. Go on to the next one. So at this point, I want to talk briefly about our reserve continuity. And I think that the two pieces that I want to out want to point out here is that our actual reserves currently, and this slide that you see is speaking directly to the general reserves in your package that you have uh, as part of the minutes of this meeting, it has the general reserve and the utility reserves also, but in the case that we presented utilities earlier this fall, I'm going to narrow the discussion today to the general reserve. And you'll note that there's approximately $40 million in the general reserve at the end of 2020. And we're drawing that down such that by the end of 2024 or in the 2024 year, we'll be down to uh, a number around 15 or $16 million. And the rationale for that are two things that are occurring. One is the land reserve currently has about $12 million in it. We have, are using the land reserve to pay for these three major projects, shovel ready projects that we have undertaken and we are using the land reserve to support debt financing for those three projects and as a result we anticipate that by the end of 2022 we will have used up all of the existing land reserve and therefore in 2023 or previously prior i should say if if possible uh we would replenish the land reserve and that is the amount that we had identified previously, approximately $12.9 million, that magic number keeps coming up. Um, and so we're showing that 
uh, within the documentation is appearing in 2023, replenishing the reserve, and then the reserve will be used again to fund future projects as we move forward. The other major change in our reserve continuity schedule is the fact that the Community Works Fund has been wrapped up. The federal government has made the decision that this program, uh, after a 10-year run, will be completed, and we're hopeful that the uh, federal government will come up with another program to support communities, but uh, at this point in time, no such program has been announced. So uh, our understanding is that we have until the end of 2023 to use the money, and if we don't use the money by that point in time, we will probably have to return it. So that is a definite use it or lose it, so we're going to use it. Uh, we have identified a number of projects uh, that are outlined in your package to on which to spend this money, uh, and we'll speak to those in a moment. So that's the the bulk of the presentation, and at this point, I'm going to ask uh, some people to step in and and provide some additional information, and I'm. Just checking to see which order they're in. So I would ask if Mr. Bragg is on the line, if he would be able to uh, address some comments with respect to the capital REFMP projects, specifically Public Works and the Tantalus Fire Hall. So I will pause here for a moment. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you, uh, Mr. Russell. Yeah, I just wanted to update where we're sitting with the RF and P, <clears throat> with the RF and P projects, uh, in particular the two major ones we've got under underway. Um, aside uh, from the one that's under construction, um, we'll be coming back in November nine to update in a lot more detail here. But just an overview. Um, so the public works we've just gone through a value engineering um, stage, and what that does is confirm our pricing, confirm our sizing, um, and confirm where our costs are and where we're going to be allocating. Uh, all these things within the project. So we're, we're stalled by about a month and a half, two months on the, on the overall timeline. Uh, but the reason we've done that is to make sure that the costs are in check. So at the moment, we're sitting on about $21 million and that's without contingency. And this is a class level, uh, a class D level budget. Um, and that is a placeholder for now. So as we work through this process, we'll get a finer grasp on the details of, um, of costs. Um, and we'll head into class A at about March next year. Um, we've got a few uh, constraints on the site at the moment, which has been pushing some of the timeline and costs out as well. We've got some soil contamination items that we're working through. Uh, the flood level is working um, uh, through the design as well about how we raise certain areas and, uh, and work through the, uh, an emergency situation should a flood occur. Um, and we're also working with the wastewater treatment plant next door um, on their future expansion and allowing uh, growth um, and taking away certain areas from the site plan to make sure that they've got um, their growth is um, is accommodated for. On the Tantalus Fire Hall, um, the massing drawings are complete. Um, we've got a different setup on this one where we've got a um, the architect and the builder are working together. It's different than our typical um, construction management contracts. It's called IPD. Um, we're focused on the temporary fire hall works, um, and that's oh, sorry, the temporary fire hall location, which is in works at the moment. Um, and from the budget standpoint, we're at a class D, and it's very early stages in the project. And we've allocated ten million dollars um, from the budget side, and that includes a contingency. Thank you very much, Mr. Bray. Uh, now I would ask if. Uh... Mr. Cordell and Mr. Ng could uh, make a comment or should we pause for a question? No, let's run through them all, please. Okay. So at this point, I think we're going to be joined by Mr. Ng and Mr. Cordell. All right. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Russell. So Conrad and I um, are here to provide a summary of the TTP investment to date, provide um, some information to the budget and what's planned for next year, and then as well as talk about requirements for the ongoing support and development 
for the digital infrastructure that the TTP has deployed at the close of the TTP at the end of next year and going into 23. And to date, the investment has been about $5.1 million. And then the pie chart below shows the breakdown by contractor, by staff, and other and other is equipment, such as software licenses. Um, as discussed a few weeks ago with the Committee of the Whole, the accomplishments have been significant as we have a brand new financial architecture and system. It's a central repository for all district financial information and it's allowing the finance team to provide improved services for accounts payable, for procurement, for payroll, and for reporting. Uh, last year, we launched a new business license system and that's part of the development management platform, whereas central repository for all information is related to a parcel of land. Uh, we're deploying a new recreation management system over the next couple of weeks and in advance of winter registration, bringing these services online, not only to the community, but also to staff. And even though they're a bit smaller in scope, um, the services, whether they're upgrades or deployments, um, um, have directly impacted service levels to the positive for critical teams such as bylaws and Squamish Fire. I just want to draw your attention to the pie chart, in particular the skew between contractor and staff, as particularly in the early early years, 2016 up until say 2020, um, we were reliant, the numbers show, on contractors. And the reason for that is we needed their expertise. These are brand new systems, these are complicated systems that no one had experience in per se. So we needed their help. We needed the help to get comfortable with it, to understand them, to obtain work knowledge and now expertise. Further, we needed their assistance to help us sift through the data and the processes that were years, 5, 10, 15, 20, in the making in the software world, that's multiple lifetimes. So, but the tide has shifted and shifted at the end of 20 and into 21 and definitely into 22 as the investment is with our people, it's with our staff. As the staff now, from the years of experience, we are leading the deployments. We can support, we can maintain, we build the in-house resiliency and expertise. So as Mr. Russell had mentioned, shovel ready, we are virtually shovel ready to deploy new services to assist on, or new systems to assist on services for property taxes, utilities, dog license ticketing, um, bringing these services online in addition to business license and permits, and then assisting the internal teams, customer service and HR and finance um, with new tools, these new tools to help continue to deliver outstanding services. The investment in staff is paying dividends and most importantly because we are now we have the resiliency and self-sufficiency and expertise to support and develop these these digital infrastructures and i'm going to hand over now to conrad as he's going to talk about continuing that momentum with the close of the ttp at the end of next year and going into 23. thanks kerry uh, good morning man council um yeah as we as we close out the ttp um we want to focus on the new platforms and, and solutions that have been implemented and make sure they're optimized. Um, we want to tweak and improve them uh, as best as we can and, and really engage with our users and, and, and review what's been done and make sure our users are actually getting what they need. They're getting the full value from our investment. So that, that can include additional functionality, uh, more data, uh, better reporting. Um, and really, we're looking at our platforms, but really everything to the left there that's been implemented uh, should should have a review um, and user engagement. Um, we're also going to continue with maintenance and upgrades. Uh, we need to ensure these systems are up to date. Uh, they're secure. Um, and so we need to continue on that schedule. And then at the bottom, you know, you're seeing the service level changes that have already been presented to council. Um, you know, these are the additional FTEs uh, that will start in 2022, uh, which will help us do this work and, and keep our momentum. Um, as we move beyond the TTP, you know, we need to continue to build on the platforms we've implemented. Um, we know there's a need for <clears throat> asset management uh, as well as work order management. Uh, Again, that system, those systems would tie back to our financial solution to the platforms we've implemented. Uh, so we'll be exploring uh, those solutions. Uh, we'll need to expand our online services and capabilities and continue with open data initiatives. So really getting uh, full value out of that growing amount of data that we're collecting with these new solutions and make more of that data available. 
Um, and, and as it says there, it will continue to require consultants. Um, you know, it'll be a mix of consultants and staff resources, but the majority of the staff uh, of the resources will be internal staff. And, and so these are people that know our organization, they know our systems, understand our needs. Um, and so we're, we'll be set up to, to, to use our internal resources um, and only bring in consultants um, when we really need some specialized expertise. And with that, I'll hand it back over to uh, Rowan. Thank you very much, Mr. Ng and Mr. Cordell. Um, continue on. So I wanted to <clears throat> give council a highlight of uh, some of the new projects that are, are included in this year's uh, 2022 through 2026 financial plan. Uh, we've included new fleet replacement projects for 2026. So you will see that there are five years worth of fleet replacements. Included in the plan are also uh, lifting equipment for the new public works building. There's server room equipment for fire hall one. We have uh, the start of the uh, earth drive active transportation project, which is uh, going to be funded by CWF. We have annual road paint markings. This is a new project that's being phased in for two tax supports. So right now it's starting with accumulated surplus, but over the next three years, it'll be moved from accumulated surplus to tax support. We have a storm system repair and replacement program, which is uh, which is also being phased in to to overall tax support. And the last, but certainly not the least, in fact, probably the most significant project that we're adding this year is the Brenham Park Recreation Center revitalization number one, and that is being funded primarily through the uh, GIC, which is green, okay. and I'm going to fumble this one, but I, I believe it's, it has green communities, and uh, I think there's an incentive in there, so uh, we'll just go with that. And uh, I want to say those are our new projects for this year. And so the last thing that we wanted to talk about were projects for council consideration. So under the listing of projects for council consideration, there are four or five projects. Well, okay, maybe six. Um, and some of these projects were identified as projects that we would want to commence in 2023. And some of these projects have been pushed to 2023. Uh, there's a list here in front of you and uh, you have in your package documentation around what those projects entail. So what we're hoping at this point in time is for council to ask any questions they would like with respect to the 2022 through 2026 capital projects as they have been presented to you so far this morning. Thank you very much, and I will stop sharing the screen so that we can all see each other. All right, thank you for the presentation, staff. And um, now we get the fun job of asking questions. So I'll uh, turn it over to Councillor Reyes first. Thank you. And, and I just, uh, I think you lost me when we were talking about uh, Wayneck Park and item 33, uh, the Wayneck Park Sea Dyke is shown as $3,800,000 funded uh, by borrowing. Uh, and it's always been my understanding, and you confirmed it, that this is actually about a $10 million project, give or take. Um, and so when I was going through this before the meeting, I wondered why it was $3.8 million and not $10 million. Uh, but then you talk about flood protection upgrades over the five years and 2 million in 22, 4 million in 23. And so I'm wondering how we get to 10 million. Uh, I'm assuming the work is going to be done and more or less completed in 2022. It's not that big a project. Uh, and so I would expect $10 million to be spent in 2022 to pay for that. 
unless I'm wrong about that, is the project being phased, I guess, is one question. Uh, and the second question is, how are we accounting for the balance of the monies? Through the chair? Um, there's $6.2 million in the 2021 budget and $3.8 million in the 2022 budget. So the combination of those two would equal $10 million. The project has been has started already this year and they are spending money on on that project. Um, and I'm going to suggest that in the next few weeks, I'm not sure the exact date, uh, we will be providing a third quarter project update. And at that point in time, we'll be able to provide you with a more accurate number of what their current spending is. We anticipate that they will not spend the full $6 million this year. There has been some slowdown in, in their progress and we're aware of that. Uh, so we anticipate that they will carry some of that funding forward into 2022. So the overall project is $10 million. The future portion, the 22 portion is 3.8. We don't anticipate that they will spend all of the 6.2 this year. So overall, they will spend more than the 3.8 next year. Thank you. So, so that answers my question. Give or take $6 million will be a carryover from the 2021 budget, which we don't see in front of us. And the last information, <clears throat> excuse me, the last information we had was that that project, which was slated to start in September has now been put off until approximately December because of permitting. Uh, and so probably significantly a lot of that $6 million will be carried over. So that just doesn't show here. That's the only, that, that's the answer to the question really. To the chair, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe that that's your only question for the entire capital budget, but so far. Uh, others, Councillor Anderson. Mr. Russell, I have a question regarding item number two in the capital projects list. This is under the fire department or protective services. And the item is uh, an F-550 truck with the hook lift system. And I'll just read the description. Squamish's fire current initial attack vehicle lacks the capacity to carry the water and crew needed for a rapid initial attack. And F-500 would provide the needed capacity. Um, before I ask the question, I, um, I note in another report that we'll be discussing later today, there's a reference to a wildfire trailer, and it's described as being a shared asset with Whistler. My question with respect to item number two, the truck with a hook lift system, is to whether there is potential or e indeed planning to share this uh, piece of equipment. Can it be shared? Can the costs be shared with neighboring jurisdictions such as Area D of the SLRD and, and Whistler, for example? Is there some potential to share that uh, in that wildfire is something uh, that we plan together with our adjacent municipalities, the resources to, to cope? Through the chair, uh, this is a two-part question. And I'll answer the financing aspect of the question. Um, the, the start that again. The asset that we're looking to purchase would be owned and operated and managed by the district of Squamish. So we're going to pay for the asset, which would be a truck with a hook lift system. Um, my understanding is that fire suppression services tend to be shared between districts but I will defer to, uh, to Chief Stoner to answer any other questions with respect to how all that would look. Thank you. Through the chair. Go ahead, Chief Stoner. No, thank you. Through the, thank you. Um, yeah, no, we, this particular piece of equipment is harder to share than a fire prevention trailer because really the idea of this is, is quick response. Um, we want to be able to hit a fire when it's quite small with it. Truck carries 150 gallons of water. We want to be able to hit the fire when 150 gallons of water will have a significant impact. So it's not really a piece of equipment that can be shared in that respect. As far as uh, um, working with our other jurisdictions, interestingly, we have North Van and, and Whistler in the next room talking about um, 
you reviewing last season's uh, flyer prevention or flyer response and looking ahead to next wildfire season about how we can work together. So we, we do. Um, and we are always in talks with um, the regional district about having a fire service agreement with them. And I'm hoping that we see something come out of that. So we do work with our neighboring communities, but this particular piece of equipment is not ideally set up for sharing. Thank you, Mr. Russell, Fire Chief Stoner. Uh, Mayor Elliott, my Can second... I um, follow up on that question with Chief Stoner before we lose him? You're okay with that? And I'll come back to you. I just want to follow up on this item. So, Council, if, if there are items that another councillor asks about and you have a follow up question, let's try and deal with them all at the same time. So, we might jump around a bit, but I'll try and keep the order straight. I just don't want to have Chief Stoner answer a question and then 15 minutes later, answer a question on the same topic. So, um, Chief Stoner, are, are you seeing this kind of system being deployed around the province successfully? Like, where, where are the, where's the idea for this coming from? This piece of equipment is being deployed, but I wouldn't see this as a piece of equipment that we would deploy. Um, it's what we deployed last summer were crews, which kept our equipment in Squamish in case we needed it, which is our number one concern. This piece of equipment would fall into that category where it would be our initial response vehicle and unless there was perhaps something in Whistler immediately next door to us, I wouldn't see it as a deployable piece of equipment because of our need for it here in Squamish. Sorry, I don't think my question was very clear. Um, have other communities bought similar equipment and found it successful in a rapid response to our interface fire? Yeah, absolutely. It is a pretty standard piece of equipment. Whistler has three of these pieces of equipment, for example. Thank you. Back to you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Uh, my next question concerns uh, Mr. Russell, item number 98, the parks satellite. Now this uh, addresses uh, a downtown parks maintenance hub. I guess I could paraphrase it. I hope that's accurate. The budget ask is for forty thousand dollars in year 2022, sixty thousand dollars in year 2023. There's reference to the existing tenant in the old fire hall nearby here, and I just wondered whether there is a clear plan to utilize these funds, whether there's a clear plan for shared use or a schedule of, um, of uh, a change of use in that particular facility. How is it going in planning around the existing tenants use of that facility? Uh, through the chair, I'll attempt to answer this one from, from my umbrella here. Um, it's in early stages of planning at the moment. We basically placeholded it and hence why we've allocated that number of funds over the next two years here. Um, we don't have any details or strategy on specifically what we're doing there. So I can't answer that in detail. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. That, that clarifies my, my interest there. I did have a follow up, another question, perhaps for Mr. Bragg, uh, Mayor Elliott. This concerns item number 96. Now there's a three years uh, looking ahead, $150,000 to be allocated next year and each of the following two years for the uh, covered structure for parks. Um, I wondered whether you could clarify what is the, the source of the funding between the grants and the reserves, just a little bit of a breakdown there. But my second question is whether we may be able, uh, we as council, to have some kind of a, um, a map or a schedule or a, really a a sketch, if you like, and not, it doesn't need to be in detail, but where are the structures going? Is there a plan that council can review? And my reason for asking this is this project has received a good deal of, of public discussion. And I'm just wanting to be a little bit more clear as to the game plan for locations and functions of the plan structures over the next uh, three years. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, that 
that was a two-part question there. I think one was the finance side and the other one was the more strategic side, which I'll get Mr. Buxton on to answer some of that as well. Um, you know, we've allocated $150,000 over the next two years. Um, and from a location point, what we do is we listen to the community group. So right now it's a placeholder. And Mr. Buxton, if you wanted to expand on the uh, the strategy there. Uh, sorry, through the chair. I, I don't know that we that I have much more to add, Cal. Um, we can certainly, prior to getting any work started on using that budget next year, come back to council with here's where we plan to to use the funds. Right now, I think our only um, our only item that we have is is sales at a park um, over a playground at a park close to downtown. Um, beyond that, we don't really have a plan, so we can bring that back to council at any time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor Elliott. I've got Council Hereford, then Council Pettengill, and then Council Rates. Thank you. Um, I just want to sort of hone in on, I guess the theme is, is vehicles here. There's a lot of vehicles in this um, as we particularly as we look out into future years. Um, I can see the ones, I was happy to see the ones that are more immediate, um, specify electric and the um, item 15, that electric Ford F-150 is quite exciting, I, I think. Um, as we go down um, and sort of further out uh, in the plan, the replacements are less, um, uh, aren't necessarily as specified. And I understand these are, placeholders for future replacements, but I'm curious as to how and when um, we bake into this the um, the expectation of electric. I can see it happening, so I see the staff's responsive to that, but I'm curious, that section, particularly where we get into all these, um, all these trucks, uh, items 60 through, uh, in general, 60 through 67, sort of like that, that era, which pushes us out into 2025, um, how do we capture that expectation uh, at at this point where the closer ones we're specifying the exact vehicle that is going to be the replacement? And I understand that these ones um, are more, these are the vehicles that we're going to replace, not what they're being replaced with. So I'm just curious about how close we get before we start to see that that shift. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Through the chair, I can provide that um, between the, the fleet supervisor, the director of public works and myself, we're crystal clear um, that we're buying electrical vehicles. We, we provide that detail as we can. We're not providing that detail on the, on the later purchases because in part, those vehicles don't exist or we're not sure that when we get to that point, they'll be even if they exist that we can purchase them. But we're crystal clear um, that um, if an, an electric option is available, we're purchasing that option. It's just, we're, we're reluctant to say we're gonna buy an F550 in 2024 if it, if it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna make a promise that we cannot keep. I don't know, Mr. Smith, if you, if you have any more detail. Through the chair, um... Yeah, I do have a little bit more detail. We, we, I, item 15, um, to speak specifically to that is, is a bit of a hybrid description. We want electric. Um, we hear loud and clear that, that council is after electric vehicles. So we put electric F 150 for, for the road supervisor in there. Um, the 35 seven is not an electric vehicle. The 35,700 that's for an F 150, a standard F 150. So, um, we're we're reviewing our options. We're seeing what's available with the F-150s right now. They're just not available is where it's at, unfortunately. So we're still hoping that that'll happen. Um, so, um, you know, other, other options that we've looked at is the Maverick, which is a hybrid um, without trying to get into a whole lot of detail here. But <clears throat> the the number, if that's going to be electric, would be above 70,000. So um, we haven't instilled that throughout the budget from item 61 down, um, because we don't really know further to what Mr. Buxton says. We're, we're not certain about how the pricing is gonna be, what the capability is. So we're just keeping the status quo until we find out what the actual um, answers are. So I just wanted to be clear on item 15 that that's for a, the budget is for a normally aspirated F-150.
Thank you. And um, you foreshadowed nicely. My my second question was uh, around if the uh, dollar the dollars allocated in that um, that 2025 sort of chunk of replacements from my my gut seemed low given that currently um, as you stated there the um, the the electrification tends to uh, so far anyways uh, bump the pricing on these things up so I want to make sure that looking forward we're leaving enough room there so that when we do get there it's not a oh well we did you know we're we're kind of handcuffed now because we we didn't allocate enough um, funds for it so I was curious about the appropriateness of that um, the costing of those placeholders. Yeah, I'll, I'll have Bob. I'll have first crack at this. Um, what, in terms of baking baking it in, what we likely do need to do is address that very issue, uh, Councillor Herford's raised, and go back through the fleet disposition um, plan and the reserve and rebudget those um, normally aspirated vehicles with with EV pricing. So if there's anywhere that we were going to quote bake this decision, it would be to go revisit that uh, that fund allocation amounts and that's work that's on our to-do list in the next sort of few months. So yeah, we're, we're alive, we're very alive to that issue. So. No, thank you. And and uh, I can I can see that that we are as what that we are as an organization. I just want to make sure that we're all of us all are are on are on this. Um, I'm I'm just going to go back to the the um, item 15 for a second, and then I'll be done with this topic. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just curious with the description with the new information in that description on 15. Should we not drop the electric out of this ask just for transparency? Uh, I, I get that it's aspirational uh, to get to electric, but it doesn't feel like it's going to happen with the budget ask or availability. Um, so for for transparency, maybe it's just the the wording thing. I was a bit of an emotional roller coaster ride here with with that one myself. So I can imagine the community would uh, maybe feel the same. Anyways, I'll leave it at there. Thank you. Did you? You're next on the list, but I have a question specifically about what Councillor Herford was asking about. You have a similar. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Fango. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, just wondering, and I know we've asked about this before, but um, if if staff could remind me, um, the the price and availability of this the vehicles, the EV vehicles, is one thing, but have we started to turn our minds to what this means in terms of labor costs and space needs as we shift to electric vehicles, which presumably need less maintenance, but they maybe need some different infrastructure. Um, has that sort of costing started to flow through the rest of our financial modeling yet, or is uh, is that still work to be done? I, I'll start and uh, maybe Mr. Smith can add on. Yes, we're aware of those issues, principally of which is the largest cost item that, that we're going to have to deal with is the charging infrastructure. Um, and we're looking at that at the public works facility uh, redevelopment. Um, at present, we don't have a, there isn't a lot of history or track record with with maintenance requirements on EVs. Yes, the engines are um, less maintenance. The rest of it is about the same. Um, so we just don't have a lot. Yeah, we are alive to the issue. We just don't have a lot of data right now to know how much less or what the changes on on maintenance requirements in terms of spacing. Um, if we have more vehicles, it's not really going to affect the space we need for maintenance greatly. But again, that's being covered off in the um, in the design of the public works facility. But I don't know if Mr. Smith, if you had anything else to add. So on the same topic, the piece of information that seems to be missing for me is Every diesel truck we buy from here on in commits us to so many years of GHG emissions. Yesterday, the province announced a new deadline for light duty vehicles to all be EV by 2035. So, um, Council Herford mentions this F-150 being aspirational, but why, why wouldn't we wait until we could get it? 
And so where's the plan to show which vehicles we should hold and repair a little longer until the market is able to provide us with um, an electric vehicle versus investing in more diesel vehicles who we can imagine over time, their trade in value declines and we're also just doubling down on more GHG emissions. So, you know, I guess my question to Mr. Piggott and to Mr. Smith is, where is that calculation happening about where it's better to just keep and hold and repair a bit longer um, and not follow our reserve or vehicle replacement schedule because we know what's on the horizon and we can transition our fleet faster? Where's that plan? Maybe I can have first crack at this, Bob. Um, the principle we're working on right now is that if if we can accurately predict when the EV is available, we'll defer that that decision. But if we can't provide a a reasonably reassurance of of being able to obtain that vehicle at a future point in time, we're we're delaying the purchase of a vehicle. Um, to a point that we don't know, um, the maintenance costs in the interim will go up. If the vehicle fails, then we're simply without that vehicle. Um, some of these vehicles, particularly the heavy duty vehicles, we don't have in large number and not having it could be a critical gap in service. So it's a very difficult um, tightrope to walk in terms of deferring it. The principle we're working on is deferring if we know to which point we can defer. Um, if it's unknown, um, then it's very difficult for us to potentially nurse made that vehicle through the two or three years out that it may be that, that the technology is available. And if that vehicle fails in those three years, it's either a very costly immediate replacement or very costly repairs. It's just very difficult to try and predict when some of this technology is going to be available. Mr. Pickett. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you want to go ahead first? Or? Mr. Pickett. Okay, thank you. Through the chair. Um, so uh, one thing I just wanted to add is that we are have just embarked on a telematics fleet assessment that is going to give us much more high resolution information about the how uh, about a plan for replacing vehicles with electric vehicles. So the outputs of that study is, is going to be really informative uh, to that. Um, uh, included in that study is going to be some projections on where we might be able to find external funding to help facilitate the purchase and offset the extra costs of an electric vehicle. So we do believe that that is going to be very helpful information. Thank you. Thank you. I guess my question is, is it time for us to have a fleet master plan that, it, that is addressing the climate emergency? I, through the chair, I, I believe that we do of a sort. I mean, we have the fleet replacement plan. We have the reserve in place. We do need to revisit those costs, but the, the reserve is robust um, and we will replace at as available um, and when we can predict. I mean, that is our plan. We will replace with electric if the technology is available or it's at a predictable point in time. Beyond that, it's very difficult to um, guarantee that we will purchase EVs that may not exist or are not available. With respect, Mr. Buxton, I don't think what we have is a climate focused fleet master plan. So that's that's what I'm trying to get. We have pieces. We have a new study coming, and we have a very um, established uh, fleet reserve and a fleet replacement schedule. But those weren't built with dropping our emissions by 45 percent by 2030. They weren't built with reaching carbon neutrality. They weren't built with new rules from government coming that we've got to have all light duty vehicles. You know switched over um, and we sh we should do it as fast as possible. So that's what I'm saying is that, you know, I think we're still speaking um, in terms that are not related to the climate emergency. 
We haven't put that lens across this yet. That's not my impression. Mr. Smith. Um, to the chair, uh, you're absolutely correct. Our, our master plan is based on 2010, uh, 2011, I believe is when we had that. And it walks us through um, how long to keep a normally aspirated vehicle. And at a certain point, they become very expensive to maintain if you hold them longer than you should um, in that plan. And, and that's that's what we're we're working with. If we keep these vehicles longer, they cost us more. Transmissions go, engines go, more expensive repairs happen, more resources required for doing the maintenance and more, you know, potentially renting vehicles. So the cost definitely goes up if we hold on to the existing normally aspirated fleet. And in answer to your question, no, we don't have a master plan that reflects the climate emergency. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tasked with trying to figure out the best way to do it. We've got six bolts in the fleet where I think we're doing a good job wherever we can. Um, you know, we're keeping our eye obviously on the on the, the Ford Lightning and some of the other pickup trucks that are coming out. And But we don't have a formal plan as to how to actually get there. And um, to be honest, that would actually help me. To, to make some of these decisions and answer some of the questions that council is, is coming up with. Because um, you, you folks definitely have a mandate to, to follow that climate emergency and we're trying to help. And um, yeah, so answer your question. No, we don't have that. And, and yeah, we probably need one. I think it's something, you know, given the study that Mr. Pickett just spoke about is probably appropriate for um, 2023 so that We've got better guidance and a more up to date plan. Um, I think we'll have more visibility through this year about electric vehicles, but um, I can't, I just don't think we should be operating on past assumptions. And while it might be more expensive to fix a transmission, the costs we're going to spend on flooding uh, and responding to emergencies from fires and heat domes and those probably far outweigh what we'll spend on fixing a transmission. Potentially, so I think it's just trying to uh, build something into our future fleet plan that is up to date and weighs the pros and cons in a slightly different way than we have in the past. But thanks for the input. Um, are you were you complete with your questions, Council Herford? Council Pattengo. Thanks. Um, shift uh, jump around a little bit on topics. Um, was curious um, the comment about there's no contingency yet in the estimate for the public works yard, but we got contingencies in both the fire hall estimates uh, in early days. And I'm just wondering why no contingency, why we're not sort of thinking in that context for public works. Uh, through the chair, that's a good question. Um, the The budget at this stage is very early in the process, and what we found is we're in particular in public works here. We're coming up to a few hurdles. Um, one of them is soil contamination. The other one is uh, wastewater treatment plant allowances for space here. Um, the other one is the uh, the flood control and how we um, determine the levels of the building. Um, all this is pushing our budgets around a little bit. So I can't solidify the budget so early in this process. So we do have a small amount of contingency in there um, to go back on what I was saying. It's not enough and we're not going to be at that stage knowing what the contingency will be for another few months here as we work through this process. So we do have a small amount in there. It's not enough. And that budget number is going to change from our side um, as we work through this process between now and uh, Class A. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there's some park related requests uh, above and below the line. Uh, and it wasn't clear to me how that aligns or doesn't align with some of our master planning and the, the, um, the recreation master plan and so on. I'm just wondering if someone on staff can speak to um, are we sort of Thinking of these because they might be a, an opportunity, even though they're outside of the plan, or, or do they align clearly with our, our plans? Through the chair. Sorry, Councillor Pettingill. Can you, is there a way you could refocus that question? Is there something particular? I mean, what we have is Dentville, in terms of parks, I believe it's Dentville, which is finishing the park that we've already started. My recollection is the only one below the line was the no name park, no name road park. Am I on the right track here? 
Uh, yeah, there's also a a pump track uh, paving, uh, which to my mind is sort of a, a parks and trails thing. Um, there's a water fountain below the line in Stan Clark Park. And and so I just, I guess I'm trying to understand the rationale for what's above the line, what's below the line, uh, what might drive us to bring something above the line. Um, just I guess, sort of looking to, to measure these against some of our, our plans. I mean, in terms of the, the Dentville is simply a continuation. No name is, no name road is, we're bringing that sort of prioritization from the parks and rec master plan in terms of parks in existing neighborhoods with efficient park areas. Um, the other two, the, the water fountain, I mean, those sorts of things aren't in the, that, that sort of level of detail isn't addressed in the master plan, parks and rec master plan. Um, I mean, it's just a matter of, there, there is only so much room above the line prioritization based on finishing the existing park and then picking up the next priority in the parks and rec master plan is, is the basic premise of, of that prioritization. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then one last one for now, and uh, I maybe should have asked this when Ms. Ms. Bloom was here, but the library is wanting amongst their funding a a vehicle of, of some sort, and it wasn't clear if if this is an electric vehicle. Um, I believe this is in relation to the mobile book uh, sort of thing. Do we know what their plans are there, and, and if the funds are asking for is adequate? Go ahead, Ms. Glendon. Thank you. Um, staff will find out the an answer to that information for you shortly. That Ms. Bloom did speak to that quite extensively, though, the 200,000. And so it's not determined what it is or what it'll be spent on or whether it'll be regional or what it will look like. So it's not, it's not fully scoped. So that's what she said. The first 4 months of this year would be to try and. Figure that out um, so that it's ready uh, for a proposal in the 2023 budget. But that she wasn't even sure it could be ready for 2023 given their other priorities. So I don't. I, I'm not sure they even determined what they need. And so to tell you whether it would be electric or not, I think is. Premature. That's my understanding. You can still follow up staff, but that's what I heard in her presentation. Council Rice. Thank you. Um, it's a different topic again, and it's number 110, the landfill gas flare horizontal pipe expansion. Uh, and it's 200,000 in 22, 24, and 26. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that's the end of it or whether we see that going on indefinitely and more or less regularly as long as the landfill keeps growing. Do we ever get to an end of that program or is that uh, sort of a cost to the landfill now? Through the chair. <clears throat> My understanding, based on the information provided to me by our engineering group, is now that we have installed uh, the landfill gas flare system, we need to extend the pipes as the landfill itself grows. So this portion will continue, and what you see there will, in all, for all intent and purposes, will end when this landfill is capped, and then we will see another project similar to this, which will be built with the next landfill, which again, it will just grow over time as the landfill fills up. It's becomes part of the oper overall operations costs of running a landfill. 
And and I kind of guess that. And I guess my question is, would we ever get to a point um, more for taxation purposes of, of saying, okay, well, then let's just put $100,000 a year into a provision instead of $200,000 every two, two years and nothing in the intermediate year, uh, just to kind of level out the tax burden. To the chair, um, yes, we could consider that. Um, right now, this project is, our, our intent is to fund this project through the solid waste reserve. So from that standpoint, any surpluses generated within the solid waste utility would go into the reserve. So there is a bit of smoothing in there intrinsically, but if it would be easier, we could certainly, you know, place a, a specific amount into the reserve annually to smooth any impacts this month would have on solid waste rates. Okay, why don't we take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at sorry, 11. Wow, time flies. Come back at 11. Okay, we're back uh, in our budget discussions around the capital um, plan for 2022 to 2026. Um, questions from council anymore? I've got a few of my own, but I'll keep the floor open. Go ahead, Councillor Anderson. <coughs> Mr. Russell, I'd like to ask a question regarding item number 24, transportation system improvements. The item description includes a reference to a particular intersection, uh, one that we visited on our council bike tour in September. And uh, so I'll just quote, further works are anticipated at the Clark Drive Highway 99 intersection in 2022 to improve pedestrian safety and to complement improvements previously made, unquote. This morning, I found the not only the Clark Drive intersection, but the Guilford Drive and Burner Drive intersection to be highly congested. And in poor weather, this can lead to uh, both of those con uh, intersections, and this can lead to risk for pedestrians. So I wonder if there may be any staff available who could speak to specific improvements uh, that are being planned for that Clark Drive or indeed the neighboring intersection, if that's also what is intended. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I'm going to defer because I now see Mr. Morwood on the line. So I'll let him answer this one. We're Thanks. just seeing who was brave enough to turn their camera on. So go ahead, Mr. Morwood. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, through the mayor, um, actually, I actually don't have much information. Sorry, I wasn't at the uh, the bike tour, so I'm not familiar with the with the, uh, the comment. Um, I know that um, Ms. Gunn, our, our transportation planner, has received complaints about the congestion um, at, the, at the Clark and, and highway intersection before. Um, so I, I know there was some, um, some stuff percolating in her mind, but specifically, I'm not sure. Um, but I will follow up with her um, in her absence and uh, we'll get a response to, to the councillor's question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Warwood. I, I would look forward to some further information on that uh, perhaps later. I wonder, Mayor Elliot, if I may offer a quick comment on another item, and it's number 27, the Third Avenue bridge deck repair and sealing. And this is the bridge at the south end of Third Avenue uh, to Squamish Terminals. Um, and my comment is, uh, that uh, this bridge to Squamish Terminals not only may need uh, repair and maintenance, but as a one lane bridge, it has always been a constraint for the operations of Squamish terminals. And nearby, we have other safety issues and constraints, namely on Vancouver Street at both the east and west ends of Vancouver Street are some real tricky places for truck as a truck route or truck route issues. So my general comment is you now this has been allocated next year $125,000 from tax for the bridge deck maintenance but we might look at the bigger picture and consider these truck routes in a, in and in looking towards squamish getting on the map for pacific gateway strategy money this is a large federal provincial uh, uh, package that gets renewed every few years and other communities north vancouver nanaimo 
other places in the lower mainland prince rupert are addressing truck route safety issues truck route improvement issues with that package and we have never really been a part of that picture or be on, to be squamish on the map for the pacific gateway strategy so that's just my brief comment i'll leave it at that is that we might examine other funding envelopes uh, to address our truck routes safety issues if not maintenance thank you thank you all right um mr russell items 39 and 40 nope 38 and 39 the backstop and the dugout replacements were these not 2021 projects that didn't have enough money in them do i recall that correctly uh through through you, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, caught me a little off guard and how to respond to address. <clears throat> the, these two projects are ongoing projects. They're, the plan is, uh, I believe three to four years to replace all the various backstops and dugouts. Um, yes, it was identified that in 2021, we would not be able to complete the work that we had planned uh, was a combination of price increases and COVID related infrastructure that was going to be difficult for us to, to get um, parts, et cetera. Um, so you'll, you'll see in the plan that there are two items. There's a $40,000, which is ongoing. And then there's, uh, I think for the dugout one, and then a $29,000, which is a carry forward from from 2021 to be added on. And then the other one is $25,000 per year for the next two to three years, I believe. Uh, so yes, there it is an ongoing project and it is anticipated that there will be some funds that will be carried forward from 21, excuse me, into 22. And then the one that we always see in our budget is the Number 25, the rail crossing improvements. But this is the first year that um, I don't see us uh, looking for a grant. It's all coming from reserve. I and mean, we've never been successful in a grant, but I'm just curious, have we just given up all hope? And, and so now we're just gonna fund these, the rest of the work from reserve? Maybe I can answer that. Um, thanks for the question. Um, we, we've we met with uh, CN Rail, who is kind of a, a partner in the, the Railway Crossing initiative that we're uh, initiatives um, that we've been doing over the last few years. Um, specifically, the main concern um, for safety is uh, Cleveland Ave Crossing. Um, Transport Canada has recently changed. There were some some overall um, uh, regulation changes that have been um, coming down the pipeline for a few years. Um, they've recently pushed back their um, deadline to implement those those changes. Um, I think until approximately uh, 2024. Um, we do anticipate um, having to upgrade Cleveland, um, the Cleveland Railway Crossing. Uh, we will do that with CN and we will apply for a grant at, at that um, time. So I think right now our estimate is 2024. Thank you for that. Um, I know Ms. Gunn isn't here today, so maybe these questions have to wait, but um, item 24, the transportation system improvements and then the Item 32, transit stop infrastructure improvements. Um, how are these prioritized in terms of what rises to the top? And I'm curious, Mr. Wickham, go ahead. Sorry, I wasn't trying to uh, cut off the question there. Um, I, I, can, um, I can speak to the uh, transit. Uh, um, for, for example, and, uh, um, Ms. Ms. Gunn did, did uh, provide us a little bit of an update on, on that prior to this meeting, because we know it's something that's of great interest to, to council and obviously comfort for, um, for transit riders uh, helps increase transit ridership. Uh, and so um, 
the uh, transit improvement budget is spent on a variety of things, um, new concrete pads for shelters, wheelchair ramps, uh, example, at the hilltop, and uh, um, any construction needed to improve uh, a bus stop. For example, the chief parking lot, we had to extend the asphalt, um, and, and also, obviously, shelters themselves. Uh, and we do have boarding data. We've got really good data now from uh, BC Transit, and so we can prioritize um, where where the highest boardings are, so it's where the most people are. Um, we've done all of the easy ones. Um, there are issues. These aren't as easy as they look. <laughs> um, there are issues like uh, property lines, grades, ditches, uh, uh, anticipated upcoming road changes sometimes where we know there's development or a capital project that's going to change a road um, and we're not sure where the curb was, is going to be yet and so we'll, we'll uh, defer for a year or two until that's uh, ready to go and, and coordinate with another project. Um, so uh, we're still working uh, this year though uh, on, for example, a new income unit with the floor yeah. camp. Yeah, there's another one on Buckley um, at uh, the elementary school. Uh, next year, we're looking at Diamond Head and Mam Mamquam as, as that project uh, um, wraps up um, uh, and, and looking to resolve some of those challenging uh, areas. Um, as far as the uh, trans, trans, the other one. <laughs> trans transportation <laughs> system improvements. Thank you. Transportation <laughs> system improvements. Uh, we do use that on. Um, uh, intersections and um, speed tables and and uh, other things around town um, that uh, improve safety um, and for uh, we we really focus that on safety of the most vulnerable users and we have a, a regular uh, meeting of, of our uh, um, transportation staff committee um, that, that looks like prioritizing those. We try to do that in a very data uh, centric way um, using uh, traffic counts, uh, but also based on complaints from from uh, the local communities on where they're seeing issues. So, so we try to use sort of a hybrid approach to target those and to try to target them broadly around the community and in hotspots. I could also have I've done a little bit of digging um, and had a quick quick check in with Ms. Gunn and uh, returning to uh, Councillor Anderson's question around the Clark and 99 area. Um, I think uh, uh, during during the bike tour, we talked about the work that had been done in the area. There's not a lot of new work planned for that area. Uh, other than we are looking to improve the lighting on the way down to uh, on the quarter trail on, on the other side on the way down to Totem Hall. Um, but other than that, we don't have any uh, any current projects in the book and books in that area. Um, Mr. Warwood, Warwood, I think, would like to add to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and sorry, just going back to the uh, traffic system improvements, um, just to, to more. Um, but uh, be a bit more specific about technical review. Um, the part of that technical review is speed data. So not just traffic volumes, but speed data. Um, and, and as Mr. Wickham kind of indicated, um, the vulnerable users such as, uh, for example, around schools is, you know, if there's additional speed in around schools, um, that's especially um, prevalent. Uh, we do have um, um, an evaluation criteria. You know, it's a, it's a new, program and new funding and so we're still um, massaging that criteria about you know how you prioritize based on speed and volume and vulnerable users it's it's complicated and we're we're, we're trying to find um, the, the right um, balance in that um, uh, but so that is the first criteria uh, the second thing that we're undertaking here shortly is um, an intersection um, you know, safety review effectively. So we'll be hiring a consultant to review all our major intersections in town, um, you know, cross-reference that with, with ICBC data uh, accidents and and um, and near near misses. Um, and then based on that, prioritize kind of intersection safety um, improvements in the district. Do either of those evaluation criteria include things like proximity to social housing? The density of the neighborhood, the median income for the neighborhood. Um, so, trying to put an equity lens on this because larger cities found that when they just put the grease where the squeaky wheel was, it was often in neighborhoods where people have more capacity to advocate for themselves and they were underserving 
parts of their community where there was lower income, uh, higher density, um, those sorts of things. So, you know, given our attention to the diversity, equity, inclusion piece, you know, is that starting to appear in our evaluation um, of these types of things like bus stop infrastructure, uh, where there's lower car ownership, those kinds of things? Yeah, a great question. Um, I think a complicated um, question, and I, I, I think Mr. Wickham might want to jump in. But you know, I, I like to think that we're we're somewhat blind in that we're we're um, we're, we're not evaluating based on neighborhood or, or the number of complaints. Um, that is why we try to um, focus on on data driven um, information. Uh, we do, you know. We do try to look at where there's use for sure. I mean, that's that's a high um, uh, importance to us. So, you know, you know, uh, um, a neighborhood, for example, with spread out houses and you know not that many kids versus a neighborhood that has lots of pedestrians. You know, they're they're weighed differently um, because um, we're, we're trying to look at the improvements where people are actually using it or would use it. So, I, again, I like to think it's somewhat blind and data driven rather than complaints driven, Mr. Wickham. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly right. I, I think that is a, a really important reminder, though, as, as far as people's uh, ability to speak up or the time in the day to speak up uh, for for different different groups. Um, and we do try to balance that by by looking at actual use. For for example, the number of number of people getting on a bus at a certain stop is is where we uh, where we concentrate the uh, the bus stops and, and not the neighborhoods that that ask for them so where that data is available uh, we're absolutely using it but I, I think that's an important reminder we need to keep that uh, equity lens in mind appreciate that very much can i just ask also um on a different topic the um the denville park when this first appeared on our budget there was a cac contribution around sixty thousand dollars and maybe a total park cost in the 100, 150,000. Now it's at 224 and I feel like we've already spent money. And so I'm a bit lost about why this park is getting so much budget. And my follow-up to that is um, why there are no new parks we I feel like we've been working on this one for a number of years, and it's always underway. But where are the other parks, and how do we prioritize those? Yeah, I think for the question, I'll, I'll take the, Sorry, I'll take the first one, Jesse, in terms of prioritization. Um, yeah, this park has has taken a while to get um, to get to this point. Um, the principal reason for the for the sort of it being more expensive is we went through the design um we got the we got the public engagement done so the design was somewhat um agreed to by the community when we tended it it, it turned out to be significantly more expensive um in in this year hence the the yes we've spent most of the budget this year if not all of it and then the remainder to get to the park where we agreed with the public where it should be is is for the ask for this year. Um, the next one, it's simply below the line. Um, we couldn't push everything above the line. No, no name was the next one selected, just in terms of looking at neighbourhoods with deficient uh, with deficient park areas. So. That's the prioritization. I don't know, uh, Jess, if you have more information on on budgeting or contract costs. So. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if someone's waiting for me to respond, but no, sorry, I don't have anything um, more to add other than that. Um, this year, it, we're, we're spending approximately 50% uh, of what we believe it's going to cost to finish the, the Denville Park. Um, this year, we're focusing on the playground, and so there's a usable space by the end of the year. Um, and then next year, we'll be focusing on kind of the surrounding landscaping and um, and making the area more, you know, generally um, appealable and, and usable. Thank you. Um, 
one of the things that's on the books is the demolition of the arts council building and creating more durable washrooms there but have staff solved the issue of storage and event management for the arts council in that location because i don't see that mentioned in the description uh through the chair in short no not yet um, we'll be resolving that uh, towards the end of this year and getting finer details going then. But at this stage, no, we don't. Is that part of the scope? Yes, it is part of the scope to work out where it's going to go. But as far as budgets going to support storage, um, it's not in our budgets at the moment. I'm a little bit nervous. And I just wonder if that's something that should be captured somewhere on the budget, um, whether below the line or um, for next year. Because uh, that's something I know this council has talked about is making sure that we're we're creating a solution, not just creating a new problem in that that area. Um, uh, m my question, I have a question of on the operations piece now. I'm just trying to think about how to frame this. So last year when we were talking about adding new vehicles and new equipment, I asked the question, how do we know we need a new sidewalk maintenance or trails machine? How many, with how many new kilometers of sidewalks or trail what are the benchmarks? And so one of the things that our operations team does really well is they're benchmarking their performance, whether it's in wastewater um, or other areas. And so, but this area is totally opaque to me. And so we get budget asked for new equipment, but I don't know what it's based on. And I can't explain that. Um, I can't explain it in a transparent fashion to the taxpayer about why it was time to get a new trails maintenance machine, aside from our staff said it's time. But so that's the confusing part. There's a number of new vehicles here, new forklift, new parks, um, new trails maintenance machine. Uh, and I get that we're a growing community, but how is council to know that now is the time to invest in these things? What are the benchmarks and are there any? And Mr. Smith, I told you I was gonna ask this question in this year's budget. So you were forewarned last year. Through the chair. So I guess that question is to me. Um, yeah, we, we, we have some very robust benchmarking um, when it comes to uh, water and wastewater and, and parks. Um, our fleet utilization is a lot more complicated um, because we're, uh, we have some very specific needs. Um, you mentioned the trails machine um, and, and the trails machine is I mean, what, what we're basing our decisions on is the utilization. So we use utilize the trails machine right now um, in, in the summer months for trail maintenance for brush clearing and mowing and whatnot. And in the winter months, we use it for, for snow removal primarily, um, snow and ice control. Um, and what we're finding is that we can't keep up. And that that that's basically the line for us. It, it, you know, there's no magic kind of formula or benchmarking calculation that we use. It's just we can't get all of the work done um operating 24 hours a day to to hit all the spots basically um the separated bike lanes have, have become a real challenge for us it takes specialized equipment that's got to be narrow um, to get in there and move the snow and that that's that's basically where those thresholds happen is that we get more of that type of of infrastructure in the district and it just requires more um more equipment to deal with it in a timely fashion um so that that's kind of the short answer yeah, and I appreciate that, but we also have an active transportation master plan and a roads master plan and um, we're working on a new asset management plan. And the problem I guess I have from a budgeting perspective is that uh, out of the blue, a $600,000 piece of equipment hits the budget um, because, oh, we just hit our utilization figure. We didn't 
predict that. And so I'm wondering if there's a more predictive model out there that sort of says, you know, we know where our neighborhoods are going to expand, expand. We're doing neighborhood planning for North Crumpet. We know Oceanfront is going to build out. Same with Waterfront Landing. And so that's my, my curiosity is that these things just kind of appear rather than appearing planned for, given what we do know about where growth is happening and, and how much these pieces of equipment get used today. So, you know, I'm just trying to move towards a more planned introduction of these things to create some transparency for council and for community. Just hoping we can think about how we get closer to that. Through the, through the chair, yeah, we, we try and forecast as best we can. I'm, I'm not certain, I'd have to check and see when we first put the trails machine in. I know um, anybody in the district on staff side that listens to me knows that I've been saying, if you do, if we have more separated bike lanes, we're gonna have to have a second trails machine. And, and we've certainly been talking about it for at least two years, if not longer. Um, you know, the, the garbage truck that's in the budget this year, same thing. We've, you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're just getting more and more servicing that we're requiring to do and, and the requests are getting, getting higher. And yes, as we're growing, we're, we're trying to forecast that out. Um, so that it is in the budget and it can be, can be seen in advance. Um, but sometimes, you know, we've got to adapt as, as new requests come through, as I say, I keep using the separated bike lanes as an example, but there's a lot of, a lot of other changes that are happening within the district, including the growth and additional parts, the downtown park division that we're planning. Um, you know, we've been talking about that quite a bit. It's, it's going to take additional staff and resources to to deal with those added added features and we we do our estimates as best we can based on on our our numbers that we have on existing trail and park and and road maintenance and we forecast that through um through the chair i may, I may be able to add it may be with the we're in the process of adding um gps equipment to our rolling stock that's going to give us additional data points in terms of how much or how much distance they're covering. So we may be able to use that as a better predictive tool in terms of, hey, the, we're using it at 85% effectiveness. It's covering, just picking numbers, it's, it's covering 500 kilometers a month. We know if we add another X amount to our trail system or separate bike lanes, we're, we're likely going to need that's likely going to give us better data to be, to be able to handle that predictive element for, for this sort of equipment. But I, that's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Buxton. So I think these kinds of elements are, are should come together and, and create that, um, that visibility, because uh, we're so good at showing the community how we can benchmark all of our other operations against other communities. And just, this is the one gap that I see in that area. Yep. Um, council, yep, go ahead, Council Race, and then Council Print. Thank you. Uh, and it's with respect to uh, item seven, the annual paving program. Um, my recollection of a presentation we had, oh, one or two years ago now, uh, was that we were not spending enough on paving and we had to steadily increase it for a while. Um, and it's now 1.35 million. But it shows in the flat plan as 1.35 million for each of the next five years. And I'm wondering if that is something that also should be slowly rising. Uh, or are we at necessarily the target when you look at the description of the item um, in the back pages, it says that we're close, but not at uh, the preferred level or words to that effect. Um, thank you for the question. I might defer to Mr. Roland to this. Is is he online? So, I, um, or is are you able to answer? Uh, to... You're gonna owe me one, Jesse. Um, to the chair. There's two pieces to Councillor Race's question. The first piece is is 1.35 million dollars enough? On an annual basis, I'm going to let Jesse address that as as 
that pertains to how much work they can get done in a year and whether or not they can keep up with, with the deterioration of roads at that level. Uh, the second piece, I believe, may have been uh, more with respect to the financing of this program uh, rather than the actual amount of work. And the reference there might be the fact that it is not currently fully tax funded, whereas in the past it was. So right now, a million and fifty thousand dollars is tax funded, and three hundred thousand dollars is being funded from uh, an allocation from uh, surplus, and we're increasing the allocation of taxation by one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, so that in another two years it will be fully funded from tax. So if your question about we're making progress was related to funding, that is that is our plan. And if your the other portion of your question was related to how much paving do we get done for that, um, I'm going to have to defer that one back to Mr. Morewood. So back to you, Jesse. Well, no, actually, uh, it, it, that's not necessary. That wasn't actually the question. The question was the funding, and whether we should be steadily increasing it. And, and so I, I take from your answer that for the first couple of years we actually are doing that anyway. It just doesn't show. Uh, but then maybe the last two years, the financial plan, should we be starting to think about even continuing to ratchet it up a little bit uh, when we get to the total taxation point, just to keep up with what's required? Um, unless we get to some point where we think that's enough, I'm not sure we'll ever get to that point. But um, but that would that's more my question. It's not so much the first half of the of the five year plan. It's more the last couple of years. Should we be thinking? Uh, that now it should start to uh, increase a little bit again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you, Roland. I'm going to call you just by your first name now because I I uh, struggle to 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 with your last name here. Um, so so yes, I, I think I think there's a there's a great great question there, and there's also um, some challenges with with how we forecast in the long term and and trying to kind of find the compromise with. Um, you know, not um, budgets that that keep it keep arising. Um, when when the original um, paving master plan was completed a few years ago, which which I I think you're referring to, um, is you know I think we're we're basically on that target is 1.35. It did show an increase, um, you know, in kind of at the end of that five year term. I, I don't think the financial plan currently. Um, reflects that kind of increase in costs. Um, the increase in costs are, you know, effectively from, um, you know, inflation and and rising labor costs with our contractor. Um, so, you know, I think it can be ex in, uh, expected with paving that they will increase over time. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate that right now for the next few years, I think the 1.35 is, is on target. Um, long term, we should um, review those numbers. Council French. Thank you. Uh, item number 34 is described as an oil grit separator for the industrial park. And I didn't see a description um, of that anywhere in the, the package. I think it's self explanatory. And I found a generic description that's calling it a stormwater uh, device that's usually underground that captures oil and sediment from storm events, uh, stormwater runoff, and snow melt. And basically prevents um, oil and other contaminants from getting into fish habitat. Is is that what we're talking about with this project? Yeah. Yes, through the yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. That that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, there has been some historic um, uh, spills coming out of the industrial park, which I think um, has accelerated uh, the need for this project. And has any pre work being done on this, or are we talking about a project that is uh, from zero to end? And so, specifically, has a location been identified for uh, where this device would go in the business park? Yeah, through the mayor, uh, we have done a, a concept uh, design, uh, kind of a, a start of a design, a base design. Um, we have uh, narrowed down the location for sure. Um, there's there's some moving parts with concept designs and that you know it can it can change a little bit so I'm hesitant to say where exactly where that will be but um, it's certainly on district um, um, property 
Um, and the moving forward, the intention here is to finish the design over the winter, and then we would tender the project, um, you know, late winter of next year of, of 2021. Okay, and uh, one more follow up. Uh, is this going to be a device that will prevent contaminants from getting into the numerous ditches that are in and around the business park, or is this more about uh, protecting? Ding, uh, or preventing the contaminants from getting into the larger water bodies like the Malcolm and the Squamish nearby? Uh, through the mayor, it would uh, prevent it from, from getting into the ditches. So your, your, first, um, your first point, um, which inevitably will prevent it from getting into the bigger uh, water bodies. Great, thanks, Chair. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a few more. Um, one of the items is uh, number 88, the youth center equipment. Um, it's to supply fit out costs of this facility. Sea to Sky Community Services is actively uh, running their capital campaign and so securing donations from large donations from some donors. So, what is our role given that? In providing these fit out costs, because my understanding was that uh, they were running the capital campaign to fit out the foundry and the youth hub. Is that something you'd like to follow up on? Mayor Elliott, yes, sorry, um, Mr. Pageley is on vacation today, and so I can follow up on that specific question for council. There's quite a, a number of, um, of budget items related to the replacement of gas boilers and introducing heat pumps in buildings, and and I know we have. Um, our energy specialist who's been working on all of this and Mr. Pickett's is on our agenda later today, but is council going to get some sort of idea of this work and how it's come together and um, what we're replacing with gas, what we're replacing with electric so that we can understand the, the broad scope? It's just hard to really um, understand that work within the context of the budget, although we see some some big dollars going towards it, but we're not sure yet what the impact is. So, Mr. Pickett, I don't know whether you can help us understand when we see the details so we can make sense of the numbers being put before us. Through the chair, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, it's an excellent question. We, um, I, I don't think we're at quite a quite a place where we can give you that granularity of information. This is based off the municipal energy and emissions plan, which we just completed in July. So, uh, with help from finance, we we're able to earmark some money toward uh, early implementation of that plan. We're happy to discuss it more later this afternoon. But short answer to your question is that I don't think we're quite at a place where we can give you. Uh, more detailed information about the the reductions, other than that, were these are early steps toward the larger initiatives in the uh, municipal energy and emissions plan, and they are they pretty much align with the reduction goals there. So I think a good kind of benchmark would be the um, the goals in the meet that we need to hit. Thank you. Councilor Pengill. Yes, thank you. Um, Mayor Elliott's question reminded me of, of item 104 I wanted to ask about, which is not currently in the budget. It's for our consideration. It's for 2024, and it's to switch a hot water tank from gas to electric at the Adventure Centre. Um, if we left it below the line, does that assume staff would continue to look for grants and it would just happen if a grant was found, or do we need to bring it into this budget uh, for that to happen right now it's slated for taxation and i'm just wondering um 
because it seems like this is the sort of thing that there tends to be grants for. And so how do we make sure that um, at the very least, if there's a grant, we could get this done? Through the chair. Uh, the project is planned for 2024. If we were to determine that there was a grant opportunity for that period of time, we would uh, elevate the project and we would show it as grant funding. Okay, at this point in time, there are no grants that we're aware of that we have applied for with respect to this project. So at this point in time, it would require tax funding to complete. So clearly, if we were able to access a grant, then it would become a grant funded project. And uh, our line realistically is drawn on the basis of the amount of tax funding that we're prepared to, to apply. I just have a couple more um, operations related questions. Um, in 2023, there's a new um, vacuum truck proposed. And um, one, I thought this was on the budget before, because I remember us talking about the fact that there weren't any vacuum trucks in the region. Um, and then two, because um, we use this piece of equipment um, quarterly. Just trying to look at it. require quarterly and sometimes monthly cleaning. Is this a piece of equipment that we could share with others in the corridor? Um, through the chair, we've we've reached out to some of the communities that have um, combination trucks or vector trucks, as they're called, and um, it's very challenging for them to to share those. So we we basically, you know, in an emergency, we could probably rely on on maybe borrowing one, but yeah, from a day to day use, no, they're they're just not available to us. So we have gone down that avenue, um, and in kind of reaching back to that your previous questions about how do we do our planning. Um, one of the big things that we've started is our stormwater maintenance. Um, it's it's been left for for years, to be honest, and we're we're actively pursuing it now with contractors. So I suspect that we're going to get some direction as to what we need to do for maintenance there. So um, that that will help us um, firm up that decision and that business case for the for the vector truck. And Mr. Smith, there was also something, um, a backup generator for um, pumps uh, when we're in a flood situation. And I'm just trying to find it. Um, but it was like $200,000. And again, I was wondering um, if that's something that we could share with other municipalities because the description seemed to imply that it would be just in emergency use when we lose power yeah through the chair i'm just trying to find that one as well I, I, oh, 35. i'll speak in general as i'm flipping for it i think that that's a dryden is it not Harris oh, for Harris. Yeah. So Harris, we don't, we don't have a pump right now. The, the problem that we run into with this is the the need becomes fairly immediate. And during a, a big rain event or a storm event, we, the, the generator is just aren't available there. A lot of other people will, will be renting them and, and there's very specific needs as well. Like I can't speak to the specifics, but they're, they're big generators with different voltage requirements and, and a little bit more specific than a kind of a generic generator that you would get from from the, the rental companies. Um, so we, yeah, we're, we're trying to get our emergency preparedness set up so that that um, becomes more automatic for us. Um, right now, we do have portable generators that we, we move around to the different sites, um, but during a big power outage, it's, you know, it almost becomes uh, select which part of the community you don't want to have sewage working or drainage working properly. It's a bit, bit challenging on our end to, 
to be able to manage that during a big power outage. Thank you. Um, so council, uh, now be the time if you want to make comments on anything that you want to keep or take out or move or reprioritize. Um, while they're thinking, uh, we had a discussion earlier with the library and they were talking about um, putting in place a provision with council. And I'm wondering just if our finance staff could comment on, um, you know, do you put restrictions? Any, however, we can draw on um, internal best practices in terms of, of provisions. And yes, absolutely parameters around is, is a best practice that we would um, always employ in terms of our internal um, uh, provisions. Um, there's sort of two mechanisms you could use as well, and you could use them interchangeably or use both um, in terms of accountability. So you could have the, the parameters around the provision as well as you could approve a budget or you could do both. So it really it comes down to council and uh, the library board's will um, in, in terms of next steps for that, that piece. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, and, and and I think you know internally the ones we've used, at least that I've become aware of internally, um, are quite specific uh, to a particular use. And, and I think um, what we were talking about earlier, uh, at least in my mind, is something that's just more general, uh, but yet still not absolutely free run. Uh, so we want some idea of what these monies, if they did appear at the end of the year, uh, might be used for in the next couple of years. <clears throat> so first of all, should there be a time limit on them, for example? Uh, how long should the library board be able to just hold on to them? Are they building up a big reserve, uh, which is, of course, taxed money, and we don't want it to sit there dead as dead money? Um, and are there types of things like operational versus capital? Are there uh, different things that have to be, should, it could be used for uh, in a broad sense without having to come back to council and get direction on it. And so I think that's what we're kind of looking for uh, as opposed to something specific that it will be used for this particular use next year or something like that. So it's, it's more the general aspect of it, I think, in my mind. Um, All right, any comments on the capital budget? Um, I'd like to um, move that the uh, park satellite does not proceed until a solution's in place for the current tenant. There's a seconder for that. Bring my Councilor Pettengill. Um, so I recognize that we have needs, but we also have a complex real estate and facility master plan that includes um, the property that we are sitting on and that that fire hall is sitting on. Um, and uh, an OPS is a really important community asset right now. Um, and April is not that far away, which I believe is the end of the lease term. Um, and I don't think we should be making budget decisions uh, until we've discussed um, the future use of that area in terms of our long term real estate and facilities master plan, as well as making sure the current tenant has alternatives. It just doesn't feel good to uh, adopt this in the capital plan uh, without knowing those things. Call the question any opposed? Motion carries. Um, the other one that I wanted to put forward was that uh, staff bring back a um, a placekeeper for the Arts Council storage and event management space for Junction Park. Second to my Council Herford. Uh, and that would be prior to the demolition of the current space. Any other comments? Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Um, and finally, that uh, we refer the fleet master plan with a climate lens to the 2023 
budget discussions, as well as consideration of uh, benchmarking uh, for new vehicle purchases. Second by Councilor Herford. Any discussion? Call the question. Any opposed? Motion carries. Council Pink. I do have a question just to follow up on item 104, the, the hot water tank. I guess right now it's just for consideration and I take the point that or I heard we're going to do it in 2024. I guess I'm confused why it's not just in the budget slated for 2024 um, if I'm misunderstanding something. And I guess I'm wondering, should we just be bringing it in? Assuming we've got to get it done, we've got to go electric. Uh, and we'll look for grants. And, and so I'm just, you know, maybe it's a technicality, but to me, it, it seems like it should just be in the budget. Through the mayor. Um, in determining the priority of projects and, and where that line uh, lands, we're looking, we were looking at a number of years. So it's not just the current year, it does impact future years also. So we're trying to sort of track a, an increase in taxation for the capital plan overall over a number of years and trying to keep that in at what we think is a reasonable level vis-a-vis -vis the other pressures that are that are coming forward so it could be simply that uh we didn't feel it appropriate to be increasing the tax ask in 2024 by any more than, than was there. And so this project wasn't included. If there is a desire to have this project added in to, to the overall budget, it could be moved by council and we would, uh, we would put it above the line and, and it would adjust the tax requirement in, uh, in 2024 or in a future year accordingly. So, uh, I, I guess I'm sort of assuming, though, from the conversation, maybe I'm misunderstanding that we're sort of gathering it's going to be end of life by 2024 ish. Um, and so, if we don't spend this money in 2024, either from taxes or grants, we're going to have to spend some money in 2025 or 2026. Is that accurate? Or this is, it could go another 10 years as is. Um, and it's just sort of on that borderline of whether or not we deal with it sooner in 2024. Ms. Say, do you want to speak to this one? Hi, um, I certainly can. Uh, yes, it will be, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Um, Yes, we, uh, it certainly will be end of life in 2024. So, um, it is recommended to replace it and it would be a great opportunity to use an electric. Hot water tank rather than uh, the current gas. So, if, if it was moved up into the budget, that would be fantastic. Okay, thank you. So, given that, um, that it sounds like it will be end of life, we're going to have to do something. I would move that that item comes. Uh, above the line for uh, 2024, and, and obviously uh, we would use a grant if we can. Is there a second for that motion? Seconded by Councilor Herford. Any comments? I'll just add the comment that this is where I was chasing down some sort of summary of the uh, the work we're doing around the energy specialists because. We are being forced to make one off decisions without understanding the big picture. And that's really challenging as a council. So, yes, it's appealing to uh, replace things that uh, can be more efficient and, and get, off, get us off gas. But also, it feels really precarious to be doing this sort of uh, through a budget and not understanding the big picture of this work and where the appropriate um focus should be in the short and medium term so so i i'll support this resolution but it makes me nervous that we're doing it without without getting feedback on on all that work yet uh any opposed motion carries anything else for the capital plan i would just 
maybe just so that this ends up in the record, um, ask that an equity lens be put across our transit infrastructure and transportation uh, improvement decision making, um, as well as uh, park, um, the creation and upgrade of parks. So those three areas I think deserve that diversity, equity, and inclusion lens in our decision making. Um, so that's part of the discussion when when these proposals uh, are decided on. So yeah, so include a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens in. Uh, uh, expansion and creation of parks, uh, transit infrastructure improvements, and transportation uh, system improvements. Is there a seconder? Second by Councilor Pettengill. Any other comments? Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, Mr. Russell uh, or Mr. Rowland, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, where do we go from here? So, do you want to just talk to the community and council about next steps in the budget process? Yes, through the chair. Um, the next steps in the budget process will be for finance to bring back a. I'm trying to find the right term, a a large package, um, which will incorporate all of the various asks that you have made. In addition to that, uh, we will bring bring back uh, answers to questions that were not addressed directly within the council meeting that they were 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 made. Sorry, I can't find the right word there. Um, we'll also uh, bring back uh, the recommendations for items that have been referred to budget throughout the year, and that package will be presented in, uh, next week on November the 2nd. And what we're hoping to get from council at that point in time, uh, well, what we're hoping to provide to council at that point in time is a complete look at what the full budget package will entail and will include. And what we're hoping to get from council at that point in time is, uh, a, don't wanna use the term approval because it's we're not at an approval stage, but um, support from council to take that package to the public. And we are currently scheduled to have a public engagement on November the 23rd. So the process would be, we will bring back a package which ties everything together next week. Uh, if council is happy with what's in that package, we would then finance would work with our communications group and prepare that information in, into a presentable format for a public engagement, which will take place later in November. Uh, and subsequent to that public engagement, we would then bring back the results of the public engagement to council and council would have an opportunity to review the, the public engagement results and could provide additional direction at that point in time. So at the end of November, early December, we would then follow up with uh, the results of the public engagement. And from there, we would expect council to provide final uh, deliberation on what should be included in the financial plan bylaw and also what should be included in any of our utility rates bylaws, we would then be bringing the utility rates and the bylaws in early December and the financial plan bylaw in mid December for first reading, first three readings. Thank you. All right. We're behind schedule, Councilor Pettengill, so make it snappy. Yeah, just a, a comment. Um, we've gotten a few letters uh, about whether or not we're spending enough on active transit. And I, I just thought it was interesting looking through this when we look at the pot of, and there's other ways to, to slice and dice this, but when we look at the total money we're spending in our plan on active transit and paving together, 42% uh, or 43% is active transit and the other, uh, I guess would be 58%, 57% is on paving. So to me, that seems like a decent chunk. It still pains me to put that much money into paving. But the other interesting thing is 
the paving pieces all coming out of taxes. And so when we think about cars and the cost of cars, here's a real cost, whereas active transit, it's all grants and other sources. So we're getting all this benefit and putting a significant investment into active transit and it's not costing taxpayers directly. And so I thought that just offered some interesting perspective on how we're investing in spending. Thank you, Councilor Pettengill. Thank you, finance staff. That was that was fun. As always, Mr. Russell knows I love budget. So. Thank you, and uh, till next week. Uh, okay, Council, we have an item to adopt as our last item in the special meeting. Um, so this is the procedures bylaw to uh, come in line with the new provincial legislation on electronic participation. And so that the district of Squamish procedure bylaw amendment bylaw number 2838, 2021 be adopted. Moved by Council French, second by Council Race. Any comments? Nice to be in the 21st century. Um, call the question. Any opposed? Motion carries. Motion to terminate. Moved by Council Herford. Second by. Did you not want to terminate? If I might just make a comment. Uh, the committee of the whole meeting that's scheduled to start uh, a few minutes ago uh, will start on this link at 12:10. Twelve oh five. Twelve ten. Oh, call the question on termination. Um, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs>